Hi, everyone. My name is Suzanne Hume. I am the educational director and founder of Clean Earth for Kids, a nonprofit working to protect children's health, clean air, clean water, and non toxic lands. I'd like to introduce our fabulous youth panelists that will be answering questions tonight, and I'll start with Leanna. Thank you, Suzanne. Students, if you're watching this, you can earn community service by writing two pages of notes and a short summary of what you learned. You can also design and work on projects or apply to do an internship with us. For more information, please go to our website at cleanforkids.org. At cleanforkids.org, we also have K through 12 contests, art, music, writing, presentations, and STEM contests and challenges. We must call it out, uh, we, such as our call it out challenge. Uh, you can make a video to call out protections of our air, water, uh, public lands, that are um, those environmental protections that are being rolled back or undone. We, uh, we must call it out um, or uh, call out the cuts or rollbacks of environmental protection. Uh, we must use our voices, art, music, writing, and all sorts of media to call it out. Right. Thank you, Leanna. Um, at Clean Up for Kids, we have six teams and social and environmental justice are part of all that we do. Um, our first team is uh, Climate Action Plans and Renewable Energy. Our second team deals with trees. Our third team uh, deals with, I believe that's the water team. And uh, team four is, um, oh no, public, or okay, so team four is water. Team three is no idling and air pollution. Team five is uh, toxic chemicals and pesticides and team six is zero waste. This week we'll ask our youth panelists a few questions. Um, a few of these questions uh, are, tell us about your team and what motivates you and tell us what you are working on and what you hope to accomplish before December or next Christmas. What would be a great Christmas present for your team? For example, for my team, if we could ban a lot of these types of pesticides that we've been talking about in these webinars, it'd be amazing because it would help not only our soil health and our air pollution, air quality, but public health of our local communities. And it'd be amazing to see the difference in our communities. And so we want to just talk about how we can make this happen. Um, so starting with Leanna, could you please introduce yourself and tell us what your team does? Yes, thank you, Darren. So hi everyone, my name is Leanna Cortez. I'm the youth board lead for team one, which we work on uh, climate action plans for cities and schools, uh, renewable energy and the promotion of it, as well as promoting sustainability. So you can help your school or city uh, make a climate action plan or pass a climate resolution. You can check out team one at cleanforkids.org for more information on how to do so. And I'll show you a little bit more and talk a little bit more about climate action plans in a little bit. Additionally, our climate curriculum is coming soon. Uh, we hopefully are proposing it to the state of California, and we look forward to working with all of you, and thank you uh, for tuning in tonight. Um, I guess to answer a quick uh, bit, bit of the question, um, I think it would be a great Christmas present for um, Team 1, what just to pass uh, the climate action plans in our neighboring cities, such as like Vista, as well as um, hopefully get the climate uh, curriculum passed for the state and get it a uh, free climate curriculum, sorry, um, and get it to a bunch of teachers. So that way we can educate our fellow youth on what's happening in the world. That's awesome. Um, last week, I know that you interviewed Caitlin McCoy, who was a staff attorney with the Harvard Environmental and Energy Law Program. Uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts on her and what impressed you the most about Caitlin. Yes, so I just want to thank uh, Caitlin McCoy for also coming on last uh, week. She was um, such such an inspiration, honestly. She made such an Im a positive impact on not only uh, policy, but people's lives, because a lot of people's lives are impacted by the policy uh, that specifically climate uh, related policy that she advocates for. Um, she also uh, gives a little bit more insight about the Harvard Tracker, which is a wonderful resource for the public to use to learn more about what's happening. Um, at a federal level in terms of environmental protections. Um, I honestly just wanna thank her for coming on last week and she's really an inspiration, uh, honestly, to everybody on Clean for Kids and especially me since I'm interested in climate policy and such. And I think it's really uh, amazing to see that people are out there on the front lines fighting for um, environmental policy. Cool. Um, so what rollbacks uh, for Team 1, speaking of law, are you most concerned about and why? 
and which rollbacks are currently in court with states or environmental agencies like NRDC and, or Earth Justice who are fighting them? Yeah, of course. So um, j just like a quick little overview, all the rollbacks uh, will always kind of relate back to Team 1 since Team 1 is climate action and climate action is a, such a broad term because so many things are interconnected. You know, air pollution will also impact climate action. Uh, water and pollution will also impact climate action because it's also intertwined. So most, I'm concerned about all these rollbacks, but some of the key ones that we could share um, are some of them we've discussed before on here. So you guys, if for the, if you guys uh, um, watch us a lot, you'll maybe recognize some of these. Um, but uh, the first one I want to mention is uh, rollback number 15, which withdrew guidance uh, directing federal agencies to include greenhouse gas emissions and environmental reviews, which is extremely devastating because it basically says that they don't have to consider uh, the climate impacts of federal action, specifically greenhouse gas emissions, which greenhouse gas emissions come from our cars, they come from factories, specifically fossil fuel um, factories, and they um, impact our atmosphere and they cause the warming of it and they cause air pollution and so many other things that not only impact the environmental health, they impact public health. So this is a really uh, hard hit um, as we want to make sure that our federal actions are as climate friendly as possible. And unfortunately, that was um, done. So that's really unfortunate to hear about, but we are going to try our best to work towards getting that back. Um, this, another rollback is uh, rollback number one, which is the weakened greenhouse gas standards for passenger cars and light trucks. So this is, um, there was a previous rule that required a lot of departments and planners to track the emissions of a lot of cars, uh, set reduction targets for the mission. So basically, all right, we're making this much, let's bring it down to this much and create reports on all of that. So that way people can be informed and all of that great stuff. However, this new rule that was implemented, the safe, affordable, uh, fuel efficient rule replaced this older rule. And basically that is not required anymore, which is devastating because like I said, the greenhouse gases, a lot of those emissions come from our vehicles. Transportation is one of the largest um, causes of emission by far outside of just factories. So it's really important that we keep these emission targets and reduction targets and we try to reduce our impact. However, this rule does the opposite. Um, and then the final uh, rollback I just want to briefly discuss is rollback number two, which revoked California's power to set stricter taillight emission standards and then, uh, then the federal government. So this is also important because a lot of climate action, climate action plans, I like to focus in renewable energy, which are all components of Team One, they all focus on a lot of emissions because emissions are one of the most devastating things because it's a domino effect. Once you have higher emissions, you cause so many other problems. So it's really important that these are at to the highest standard and that is not happening with these rollbacks. So this uh, rollback basically, uh, California had very climate friendly emission standards because we're such a large state. We have a lot of cars going through a, uh, we have a lot of traffic, we have so much emissions, so we've always been on the forefront of trying to reduce those emissions so we don't have air pollution, so we don't have haze, so we don't have all of that stuff. However, uh, and that's, this, was ha this happened when um, California uh, had this power to keep these uh, emission standards when we had the Clean Air Act created and uh, they were kind of grandfathered in and they were allowed to keep their own standards outside of the federal standards. However, this waiver was revoked with this or uh, removed uh, when this rollback uh, was uh, finalized. So unfortunately, um, California must follow federal regulations, which aren't as climate friendly. And all the states before that followed California's uh, emission stands are not allowed to do so anymore. So this is really devastating um, for um, just the entire like world, basically. Um, and uh, a lot of um, organizations are fighting, uh, specifically uh, the rollbacks one and two, because uh, they are really, really important. So. And this is so important as well. Um, as, Leanna, as Leanna said, um, California has more climate friendly policies, um, and this is really important, but we also need to remember that here in San Diego County, we have the sixth worst ozone in the nation. 
So ozone is smog, air pollution. So we really have a lot to work on here in California. And the idea that the federal government or anyone would take away our right to protect children's lungs and people's health, especially in the time of COVID, is just so unacceptable. Thank you so much for all of your work on Team One. Please continue. Okay, yeah, I just want to piggyback off of that and say, like, I know this is sort of depressing, but I'm inspired in a way because I know people like you are working on it. So I'm just, yeah, very uh, grateful for all your work. And speaking of that, I know that you work a lot with uh, climate action plans, like you know a lot about them and you do a lot surrounding them. So um, I just wanted to ask you what cities have the best climate action plans and why? Yeah, of course. So just to give everyone a little bit of an idea of what a climate action plan is, it is um, a framework for cities, for school districts, for state governments to use to try and reduce greenhouse gases and any related climatic um, or climate related um, impacts. So this not only is this related to transportation, it can be uh, related to things like um, toxins, soil, trees, uh, plastic, um, so many other things because like I said earlier, a lot of things relate back to climate. So um, a few of the best city uh, climate action plans I personally think are the best um, near in uh, San Diego as well as uh, have been also notably uh, the best city climate action plans by Climate Action Campaign are the city of Encinitas and the city of San Diego. So what makes a great climate action plan is um, efficient and um, well-regulated reduction of emissions. So basically this means that they are trying, they have a goal, a year goal to reduce a, cer a certain percentage of emissions or uh, whether this comes from transportation or it comes from infrastructure and a lot of a variety of things. Another great component is um, there, usually a lot of these have a thing called um, uh, where, sorry, blanking out a little bit. <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, it's uh, community choice energy. So community choice energy allows people to gain uh, access to more renewable energy types, such as solar. Uh, that's the largest one. Um, instead of focused, on, uh, completely reliant on other forms um, that are connected to like fossil fuels and uh, all that stuff. So I think having community choice energy a part of that climate action plan is a great uh, way and to really um, make a difference because I, like I said, emissions come from transportation, but they also come from energy use. So you're kind of hitting those two points. And I think those are the most vital points to hit and in a reasonable time span. So some people uh, say it's like 2060, 2065. I think 2035 is more efficient and it's more needed um, considering the state of our planet. Uh, so both of these do a great job at hitting reduction targets and also um, allowing people to try and get community choice energy, as well as trying to reduce plastic usage and so forth. Thank you, Liana. Um, I'm also curious about uh, school districts. So do you have any idea of where school districts have the best climate action plans? Yes, of course. So I'm just going to talk about uh, school districts as well as universities um, with the best climate action plans. So uh, the first one I want to just point out to university. So UC San Diego has a wonderful climate action plan because uh, school districts are important, but so are universities because there's a, almost 30,000 plus kids on a university campus. So it's important that we try and uh, reduce the climatic um, impacts that those schools, districts, and universities can have. So UC San Diego does a great job at that by, uh, they're a big research university, so a lot of what they're um, putting, uh, their plan is to uh, focus on transportation as well as research for finding uh, better ways to um, convey like uh, zero waste or put more uh, money into renewable energy research or putting like panels and so uh, many things as well as focusing on social and environmental justice as well because I think that's really important especially on campuses with influential people and students specifically. Um, so I think their plan does a great job at that as well as uh, addressing uh, reduction targets for their emissions because they do produce a lot as they are a large university. Uh, the San Francisco Unified School District, their sustainability office had created a robust um, climate action plan recently and I think it's honestly 
one of uh, the best school district um, climate action plans. It focuses on carbon neutrality. So that's reducing their energy usage uh, by like 50% by like, I think they said 2040, as well as uh, generating 100% of their own power needs um, for their school district by I think 2050, which is pretty incredible for a school district. Um, they also talked a lot about zero waste, um, creating that connection to nature for their students, which I think is really important, as well as sustainable transportation for um, their school, uh, school buses and trying to um, create a more uh, climate friendly uh, transportation system. So that way they don't have to have single family car trips. They can have um, a lot of kids getting picked up by um, an, like an electric bus or something that doesn't rely on natural gas or um, any type of fossil fuel. So I think those two um, climate action plans for those that school district and university are probably some of the most robust and the best ones. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Wow, great information. So important. Um, and thank you so much for, for being able to, to stand in and uh, be so helpful. We're, um, of course, we're missing Janice and uh, some others tonight. And the way that you guys are so incredibly flexible and step up, that is just so incredibly uh, beautiful. I absolutely um, appreciate that and want to give you the shout out for that. That's just incredible. So let's see. Um, our 100 rollbacks. So can we uh, talk about our 100 rollbacks? So let's see. <clears throat> we have the, Leanna, you shared about uh, Caitlin from Harvard being on and talking about the work that Harvard has done. Can you give us a little more information on these 100 rollbacks? And then uh, we'll pick it up there with Kevin talking about team three as soon as uh, you go ahead and share about these cuts. Then Kevin can talk with you about what team three is doing. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Okay, so uh, like I mentioned earlier, the Harvard Tracker is an incredibly valuable source for us specifically, but also the public, because we rely a lot of our research on this tracker. It keeps us updated. It's um, So basically, it's always updated on um, where the rollback is and uh, whether if it's uh, still in progress, if it's completed, or if it's... Um, or if it's just completely gone, like there's nothing we can do about it. It just tells us basically where it's at and also tell us a little bit uh, more context into what departments are involved, um, and if there's public comment available, if it's in progress, and it gives us a link to that. So it makes it really, um, it's really uh, user friendly in that sense. So it helps us keep track of these environmental rollbacks and allows us to try our best to try and limit the amount of rollbacks that are in progress and make sure that they aren't um, completed. So it's great for that. It tells us um, about air, water, land, endangered species, anything you can think about related to the environment is probably on there. And um, it's just a great resource and I do recommend everybody check it out. I think it's something that uh, should be used in schools. We're trying to connect it to our climate curriculum we're developing. So um, it's a just great resource and the whole hundred rollbacks I think are really important for us to just know because these are cuts of our environmental protections and I think it's important for us to try and fight for them as well as stay educated on what's going on and just you know learn and educate ourselves. That's the best we can do. Absolutely. And um, so I know you reminded everybody that this is on the homepage of cleanearthforkids.org. So thank you guys so much. Yes, very absolutely important. So let's see, Kevin, could you please introduce yourself and um, tell us a little bit about Team 3? Uh, yes. So hi, I'm Kevin. I'm with Team 3. Um, we're working to reduce air pollution. And we're doing that by, you know, um, trying to get our action plans out to, uh, out in, like, the, oh gosh. Well, Hannah is writing essays to, for um, people so they understand uh, how harmful air pollution is. I'm writing poetry. And Judith is creating signs, no idling signs, um, to 
teach people or to warn people of the dangers of air pollution and what that can do to us. So we we're in this place where we really need renewable energy now. We have, according to scientists, less than 50 years before we run out or and a fossil fuel. And um, well, the atmosphere already is pretty full and I'm pretty sure it's reaching critical. No, I'm not pretty sure. There's been studies on it and it's, they say that it's getting close to critical mass or so we need clean air now. Um, kids breathe here. We need the Clean Air Act, which has been, <clears throat> which had been passed in 1970 to regulate all air emissions. It was very successful, but you know we need more. Um, so uh, please check out our no idling signs on our website and. Turn off your engines when you're parked. Yeah, thank you so much, Kevin. It's really important to talk about, uh, especially you now, idling and the need for renewable energy as uh, fossil fuels is the prime uh, cause of emissions. And those emissions cause a lot of air pollution, which is really toxic to our lungs. It's why asthma has been so prevalent, especially in younger generations. And it's why it's like the number one cause of school absences. And so that will connect to what you mentioned about the no idling signs, which is important that uh, we don't have uh, engines running near kids because a lot of like you said, kids breathe here. So thank you so much for that information. Um, so a lot of people are worried about COVID-19 and we know that um, COVID-19 um, can cause a lot of respiratory issues and that it's more prevalent among people who already have pre-existing respiratory issues. Um, and that normally is in communities of colors and uh, low income communities because those people are near um, a lot of um, factories near uh, areas of air pollution. So, um, and they have higher rates of illness. So you can talk, can you talk a little bit more why, uh, about why um, COVID-19 is becoming more prevalent in these communities outside of that? And just more about uh, COVID-19 in the relation to um, air pollution overall? Well, this is because um, of um, those communities of colors, because they live near uh, factories, they live near in places where it's more polluted, there's more particles in the air, there's more um, particulate matter. And, you know, as they go about their day outside, they breathe it in. And long term exposure can really harm and damage your lungs, your heart. It particulate matter is very harmful because when it gets in, it bypasses, well, your immune system or your immune system tries to fight it off and in the end, it kind of harms you. Um, and with this COVID-19 outbreak or pandemic, you know, we have people of, of in communities of color um, having greater mortality rates because their lungs, their hearts, their organs are already damaged from the particulate matter. And, you know, because COVID-19 is a respiratory disease, your immune system actively has to fight the disease in your respiratory system. And if your respiratory system is already damaged from, you know, pre-existing conditions or particulate matter, then you're more likely going to, well, I'm not trying to, well, die. <laughs> oh gosh, that, and that's not a good thing. Not at yeah, all. Yeah, not at all. Thank so, you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so thank you wear, so much. We've got to work on that. So I'm urging people to please wear a mask to help others. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, absolutely. Ur urging everyone to wear a mask that is absolutely important. And thank you so much for talking about COVID-19 and what's been happening and your work, all of your important poetry that you've been writing to, to give awareness and, and all of that is just so incredibly important. Um, so now we're going to talk with Catherine. So hi, Catherine. Uh, hi. Would you like to let us know? Hi, uh, would you like to talk to us about what you've been doing? Sure. And, um, yeah, so can you talk to us about Team 2 and also can you let us know how the rollbacks, um, you know, these cuts in environmental protection, how that is going to affect the Endangered Species Act? Sure. So I am Catherine. I am an intern with cleanearthforkids.org from Cal State San Marcos. I am so happy to be a part of Team 2 to work on planting trees and gardens and protecting public lands, forest, and wildlife. So what is the Endangered Species Act and how will Trump's cuts um, or rollbacks do to the Endangered Species Act? Um, so to start us off, I have a quote by Richard Nixon. It goes like this, nothing is more priceless and more worthy of preservation than the rich array of animal life with, with which our country has been blessed. It is a many faceted treasure of value to scholars, scientists, and nature lovers alike. And it forms a vital part of heritage we all share as Americans. This quote illustrates a need that Nixon had, which was to preserve wildlife and plant species. Because of, because of this, it is clear that we need to pre prevent Trump from gaining more capital at the cost of losing large amounts of species. The Endangered Species Act was signed into law in 1973 by Nixon. Its purpose is to protect and recover species and their ecosystems on which they rely. Now on Trump's cuts or rollbacks to the Endangered Species Act. The Trump administration changed the way the Endangered Species Act is constructed, making it harder to protect wildlife from many threats posed by climate change. Trump wants to make it easier to remove species from the list and wants to allow economic as assessments that would estimate lost cost revenue from a pro prohibited logging area in a, critically, in a critical habitat. This is ridiculous when deciding whether a species deserves warranted protection should not be decided on revenue or capital gain, but rather on the importance of saving species being killed for capital gain. Nixon's ideologies on protecting wildlife aims to conserve endangered species for all to have a brighter future. But Trump has been plotting to weaken the Endangered Species Act and violates the purpose of the law itself. So I will now be talking about two endangered species, two endangered animals, and why they need our help. One endangered animal that needs protection is the gray wolf. They play a key role in keeping ecosystems healthy and prevent the spread of disease. They help keep the deer and elk population in check, which benefits many other plants and animal species, which is why they're known for being a keystone species. Wolves' incredible comeback in the Northern Rockies is a great story to tell as the last native wolf in Colorado was killed in 1945, but they have made a great comeback. The main reason these wolves are threatened is because of human conflicts, but another new plan has been finalizing that really threatens this species. As mentioned last week, Earth Justice is an organization that does a lot of work dealing with protecting species and making sure the Trump administration does not abuse their power for personal gains. As stated by Earth Justice, newly confirmed Senator David Bernhard, a former, a former oil and gas lobbyist, is finalizing plans to take away federal protections from nearly all gray wolves across the U.S. This would strip protection for wolves across nearly 48 states, and they made this choice despite the fact that wolves are still functionally extinct in most of their habitats. Something that we can do to help protect them is staying informed with new petitions, data, and information coming out, as well as contacting Meggie Calwell from Earth Justice at 
415-217-2084. And I will also add her information in the chat. So for the second endangered species, we have the Florida mantee, which is a subspecies from the West Indian mantee. Mantees are endangered because of their often because they were oftentimes killed by vessels. Mantees also die because their habitat because of their habitat warming due to climate change. They also suffer from red tides and unusual cold weather events in Florida. This year, studies have shown that these creatures are dying but are difficult to study because if this animal collides with a boat, their bodies will most likely not be retrieved and therefore no data to be obtained. This is why it is very important to obey speed zones because it decreases the number of watercraft collisions with boats. To report sick or injured mantees, contact the FWC hotline at 888 408 3922 and press 7 to speak with an operator. So, how is climate change affecting our animals, you may ask? As, as with the Florida mantis, climate change affects the water in two ways. First, climate change can be fueling toxic tides that lead to red and green, uh, um, red and green tide coating California's waterways. Another way climate change is affecting animals is through higher carbon dioxide levers, levels. We can prevent toxic outbreaks by holding politicians accountable for supporting the falsehood that these toxic outbreaks are natural, even though they're not. Because with data and science, we can say that it is due to human pollution and from big corporations. There are many ways climate change is affecting animals, and we have the power to stop it with our actions and priorities. Now, let's not forget about the 100 rollbacks that are hurting. You will hear the awesome news about the Great American Outdoors Act that was passed. It is very clear that no amount of money can make up for maintenance. Moving forward, we will hear from Chelsea, and we are so grateful to the late John Lewis. Chelsea, last week you shared your tribute to John Lewis contest that helps to pay tribute and give respect to those who have worked to make a better life for others. Chelsea, can you please tell us about the Great American Outdoors Act by the late John Lewis, please? Yes, thank you, Catherine. Hi, everyone. My name is Chelsea. Last, week pre last week's presentation was dedicated to Congressman John Lewis, who dedicated his life to public service, equality, voting rights, equal pay, health care, education, and he also sponsored an important bill that passed. This bill is called the Great American Outdoors Act. This would address the overdue maintenance in our public lands as it sets aside $9.5 billion for restoring national parks, buildings, and hiking trails. Also, it would permanently fund the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which uses offshore fossil fuel revenue to provide grants for outdoor recreation projects and to protect our land, water resources, and wildlife. Unfortunately, this money for the Great American Outdoors Act will not solve the problem of the 100 rollbacks. Our protection for air, water, land, wildlife, and public health are still in the process of being cut or have been already. However, this bill is still important because it will, be, it will put people back to work, which is good for the economy. This was, oh, sorry. <laughs> this was shown many years ago. There was the CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps. It provided work to 3 million unemployed young men during the Great Depression, and they worked on many environmental projects during that time. The CCC's goal was to boost the health and morale of its enrollees, and at the same time, preserve the country's natural resources. Between 1933 and 1942, the CCC's workers planted more than 3 billion trees, performed erosion control on millions of acres of land, established many infrastructures, plus hundreds of state parks still used today, and even more related conservation projects. Putting people to work on projects that filter the air and reduce greenhouse gas emissions is amazing. In the Senate, Bernie Sanders has proposed the Green New Deal. The CCC is similar to the Green New Deal since they both aim to create new jobs while helping the environment, 
The Green New Deal's goal is to combat climate change and cut greenhouse emissions in half by 2030. To achieve this, the plan is to switch 100 to switch 100 percent renewable energy by 2030. Leanna, would you like to tell us more about the Green New Deal? Yes, thank you so much, Chelsea. So, like you mentioned, the Green New Deal is kind of a spinoff off the New Deal, which was prevalent during the Great Depression, and it helped a lot with the economic recession going on and helped get people back to work, and it ha had a lot of great benefits like the CCC. Um, so the Green New Deal is similar in the fact that we have a crisis going on, a climate crisis, and it must be addressed at a, the level that it is being um, so like, if it's a crisis, it needs to be addressed like a crisis. And right now it's not. And so the Green New Deal um, proposes that we transfer, like you said, 100% of the nation's power uh, demand uh, away from fossil fuels and towards renewables strictly. And so a lot of people are concerned, well, what about all the people working in the fossil fuel industry? What about their jobs and all that? And how is it gonna impact our economy? Well, the Green New, New, Green New Deal addresses that because um, a lot of people, their um, previous jobs in the fossil fuel industry will be transformed into renewable energy jobs um, as well. And um, the people who, for even people who are not in the industry, there will be a surplus of jobs available for people to also enter the renewable energy um, field, whether that's through engineering, whether that's through people just working and um, applying them to houses or just building the appliances. So many jobs that will um, stimulate the economy just as much as the fossil fuel industry would. However, there's a lot of complications um, because fossil fuel, um, the industry and the fossil fuel money is so um, so intertwined with a lot of policy and politics as much as we hate it to be. So the Green New Deal is trying to address um, multiple things as well as social environmental justice, which we uh, like to talk about because it's um, prevalent in all of our teams. So the Green New Deal addresses not only renewable energy, the economy, but also social environmental justice because once you get switch to renewable energy, you rid it of air pollution, you get rid of so many other problems that are affecting communities of color, low-income communities, and just public health overall. So it's a wonderful, um, it, it's a wonderful plan and it should be addressed as such. Thank you, Leanna. Now, hi Judith, I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourself and then I have some questions for you. Thank you, Chelsea. Hello, everyone. I'm Judith, an artist with cleanearthforkids.org. Thank you, Judith. So tell us about your art. What do you hope to accomplish with it? Well, first, creating, creating art has made me see how important it is to express how you feel on a piece of paper because I like to have others to, I like to have others feel what I'm feeling towards these environmental issues. Um, the drawings that I've created are not perfect, um, but does, that doesn't really matter. My art is, is my own voice and I hope to inspire others to use their own unique voices and take action. I hope to protect our national parks from haze and air pollution. I hope to reduce plastics and motivate people to re, um, use, reu um, use reusables. Um, I hope to protect our endangered species by researching and teaching you guys um, because awareness of these species is an essential step to bringing change. Thank you for that. Judith, I know you love whales. Can you tell us about your favorite whales and why they need protection? Yes, yes. Um, whales need protection and our health. Whales play an important role in, our, in the marine ecosystem. They help provide at least half of the oxygen you breathe and they fight against climate change. In fact, each great whale sequesters or hides away an estimated 33 tons of carbon dioxide on average. A ton weighs about 2,000 pounds. So a whale sequesters 60, 66,000 pounds of carbon dioxide on average, which is really surprising. Um, so one, my first um, favorite whale is the North Atlantic right whale. A fun fact would be um, that these whales are the slowest swimming whales. Um, they also, like human fin fingerprints, they have rough white patches on their heads known as callosities that are unique to each individual. Um, they're mostly found along the Atlantic coast of the US and Canada. 
So unfortunately, the North Atlantic right whale have been listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act, ESA, since 1970. They are one of the world's most endangered large whale species. Today, researchers estimate that there are about 400 right whales with fewer than 100 breeding females left. Entanglement in fishing lines att attached to traps on the ocean floor is one of the greatest threats to critically endangered right, right whales. Um, endangered, uh, sorry, entanglement um, refers to the wrapping of lines or netting around the body of an animal. Becoming entangled in fishing gear can severely s stress and injure a whale and even lead to death. Um, studies suggest that more than 85% of right whales have been entangled in fishing gears at least once, and about 60% have been entangled multiple times. With 400 right whales left in the world, they need protection in our health and our help more than ever. Another, my second favorite ant whale would be the humpback whale. Um, a fun fact would be that they are the only male humpback whale sing. They sing for hours repeating the song several times. Um, also like human fingerprints and the North Atlantic right whale, the tail of each humpback whale is unique. Um, they are found in three separate populations of hump. There are three separate populations of humpback whales, those living in the North Pacific Ocean, the North Atlantic Ocean, and those traveling the oceans of the Southern Hemisphere. Humpback whales are one of the most commonly entangled species and well known for entang entanglement in fishing gear around the world. In 2016, 50 humpback whales confirmed entangled in fishing gear off the, wet, uh, off the U.S. West Coast. Entanglement can hinder or hold back whales' ability to dive and feed, which can lead to starvation. Thanks to global conservation efforts, including the Endangered Species Act, the current population has rebounded or recovered to nearly 80,000 humpback whales, up from a low point of 10,000 to 15,000. Some simple ways you can help reduce whale mortality is that if you see any, any whales um, yeah, any whales within the areas that, that I listed. Um, keep your distance and stay 500 yards away, whether you're on a kayak, um, paddleboard, or on a boat. Another way you can help is to be informed and stay updated. Um, for more accurate information and statistics, I suggest you should go check out um, NOAA website. Um, we need to work together and protect our whales because without them, our marine ecosystem wouldn't be balanced. Peanuts for Kids would also like to thank Oceana for all their hard work protecting our oceans and working to protect our whales. Thank you for finding new ways which could save countless marine animals. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Now, Judith, what is NEPA and why do we need it? NEPA stands for National Environmental Policy Act. We need ne the NEPA process because it gives the public um, a chance to speak out about projects that will be built in their communities, I mean, yeah, in their neighborhoods, communities. And we need to protect our homes, our neighborhoods, communities, um, public lands endangered and endangered species. Um, we, there are actually um, success stories in every state. Uh, we need to know what the government projects or practices are and what environmental risks it would result to in our communities. NEPA guarantees us a voice. We must have NEPA. Thank you so much, Judith, for all the really important information and for the inspiration with all of your beautiful art. Um, I just wanted to ask you next uh, if you could explain a little bit about what MATS is and why it's important. Yes, so because of the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, um, they, since they took away MATS, mercury and air toxic standards, children who live near power, near power plants will be exposed to mercury, arsenic, and other toxins. 
Andrew Wheeler, a former coal lobbyist who, is now, who now leads the EPA, said that reducing power plants' toxic pollution is not worth the cost to industry, despite the, how it save 11,000 lives each year. Um, this is terrible because coal plants release mercury, lead, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, and carbon dioxide, a potent greenhouse gas. Con this contributes to climate change and is also linked to asthma attacks, heart problems, and other diseases. The purpose of MATS environmental protection pr was to protect children and communities from mercury and other air toxics, to toxics coming from burning fossil fuels and at power plants. Unfortunately, 68% of people of color live within 30 miles of a coal power plant. Studies show that living near a source of pollution is bad for your health. It is not healthy or safe for people to breathe in toxic air pollution from power plants, factories, busy highways, or airports. 16 states and New York City are suing for MATS protection. We are so grateful to people who are working on policies or on solutions to reduce air pollution because air pollution is a serious problem that makes people sick and, and even ends lives. All right, hi everybody. Um, my name is Jillian. I'm gonna be representing team four, um, Water is Life, Protect Water. Uh, this team works to preserve safe drinking water and protect oceans, streams, rivers, lakes, and wetlands from human threats, most notably pipeline leaks, oil spills, fracking, and other forms of pollution. Um, we know that safe drinking water, clean oceans, and healthy ecosystems depend on preventing water pollution, so protect water. Thank you so much. Absolutely, we must protect our water. And thank you, Judith, and to all of you for talking about the things we must do, cutting uh, fossil fuels, um, getting rid of those coal plants for all of the important reasons to protect everyone and to protect our animals. And that's why we're fighting so hard to, uh, to let people know about these 100 rollbacks. Um, you know, that the Trump administration has been pushing that hurt our wildlife, uh, hurt our people, hurt our people of color, children. Yes, definitely. So thank you again for, for talking about mats and, and thank you, Jillian. So uh, let's see, uh, Darren, I think that you have uh, some things that you would like to share. Oh, sure. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, fossil fuel divestment just for a quick minute. Um, so fossil fuel divestment basically just means the opposite of investment. You're just withdrawing your investments from um, certain industries or uh, companies uh, like, you know, Chevron or things like that in the fossil fuel uh, arena. And uh, I think that we should not be uh, investing in these and we should be divesting in these and um, also investing in renewable energy instead. Um, just because that uh, has a really big impact on um, how we are getting our energy from. It's already cheaper for two-thirds of the world to use renewable energy, and um, we should not be trying to make um, fossil fuels more competitive with those prices because it's bad for the environment. Um, so fossil f uh, a few uh, universities have not divested from fossil fuels yet, I know that the UC uh, University of California system has, but unfortunately, um, universities like Harvard, Columbia, Stanford, Cornell, Yale, and Georgetown, and um, globally, uh, other universities like Oxford have not completely divested from fossil fuels. And I think this is a little bit of sending uh, the wrong message because um, the reason that uh, divestment uh, is effective is just because it um, takes away their um, facade of like uh, compliance with uh, the public. So if there's not a lot of people investing in those companies anymore, then uh, people may question um, the validity and the morality of those companies, especially when big universities or big institutions are taking that step to divest. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on a little bit is uh, government's fossil fuel subsidies, because that is uh, a direct way of making these prices competitive with renewable energy. 
um, this is obviously not a good idea. And um, I believe that uh, the U.S. Uh, direct subsidies uh, amount to roughly $20 billion per year, um, with 20% currently allocated to coal and 80% to natural gas and crude oil. Um, so I believe that we should uh, be instead subsidizing renewable energy, um, first of all, because um, it's more economically efficient, and second of all, because it is uh, better, way better for our environment. Absolutely, so important. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. So would you like to talk to us about what you're working on with Team 5? Yeah, of course. So um, the purpose of Team 5, as many of you know, is to um, eliminate toxic chemicals and pesticides from our communities, as well as um, dealing with synthetic turf and getting those out of our communities as well. Um, so a few things that I'm doing with Team 5 are creating informational videos as part of our climate curriculum, as Nana has discussed earlier. Um, I created those maybe a few weeks ago, so you can check those out on our YouTube channel. Um, I've also participated in public outreach, just talking to people about synthetic turf and other things, and also talking to environmental commissions and public officials about these issues. Um, I've also connected with some interfaith organizations on uh, pesticides and soil health overall. So um, mainly just getting the word out and also um, talking to people who can make these policies and change legislation. So important. Thank you so much for all of your important work. And in a little bit, we're going to hear from Cadence to talk to us about a local issue and what we can do, because there's a really important vote that's going to take place on Wednesday. So everybody is going to need to be writing these, writing these important emails. Um, so we'll have a, an idea for you, a slide with a couple lines to the County Board of Supervisors so we can get, we can stop these toxic uh, pesticides, absolutely. So, uh, so I know that Jillian, I'd love to introduce you and have you and Darren have a conversation about the important things you're working on. Absolutely. Um, hi, my name is Jillian. I'm currently a sophomore at UNC Chapel Hill studying public health, and I study specifically the impact that um, chemicals like toxic pesticides have on the development of children in our communities. Thank you for introducing yourself. Um, have there been any experiences that you've had that have shown you why it's so important to uh, protect our health and the environment? Absolutely. Um, in my work, you know, we study case files all across the United States and really globally that deal with um, citizens who have been impacted by um, toxic chemicals and pollutions. And then literally in my own backyard, I live on a farm in the middle of the country in North Carolina and pesticides are rampantly used. So I see that these have not only um, effects on me personally, but those that work and live in the area who are exposed for prolonged periods of time. Um, it encourages me to fight for uh, getting rid of toxic chemicals. Thank you. Um, I know that uh, your work has been very extensive, so I was wondering if you could talk about anything specific uh, uh, regarding toxic pesticides uh, that are used in our communities. Sure. Um, unfortunately, toxic chemicals and pesticides affect us in more ways than people assume. Uh, I know you have shared some of these facts before um, on other panel discussions because your research is absolutely fantastic, but to kind of recap, um, toxic chemicals, they serve as endocrine disruptors, neurotoxins, they can cause liver and kidney damage, and they can impact fetal development, leading to birth defects. And the issue of toxic chemicals is so widespread. In fact, just as Suzanne mentioned, um, right in your own backyard, you are fighting for getting rid of toxic chemicals um, in your communities. Um, and I know another specific measure about making um, toxic free parks was brought up to the table not too long ago. Um, so it, it's around us and it is unfortunately very prevalent. Okay, yeah, thank you so much for all of your research and work as well. Um, I also, we know that you are very open about your struggles with lupus. So I was wondering if you have 
any advice for those of us who have uh, similar challenges of their own? Sure. Um, yes, I am very open about my struggles um, that, upon further research, probably do have something to do with pesticide use in the area. Um, and the truth is, you need to find a passion that you can choose to invest your time and energy in and not get discouraged, but when you do, pick your head up and realize that good things are happening. There are organizations like Clean Earth for Kids, which are seeking to make this world a better place. Um, and reach out to friends like the ones on this panel just to keep you in the right headspace. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for being here and for answering all my questions. Thank, thank you so much. And um, just, to, just to say as well, Jillian, um, thank you so much for, for being so brave and sharing your own experience and health challenges. Lupus is very serious and we understand um, that you're very brave in fighting this. Um, several of us have health challenges and it just, um, it just makes us work harder to identify these toxic chemicals and things that people need to avoid, air pollution, water pollution, to keep us safe. Absolutely, so absolutely important. I just wanted to ask you something else. You've also been very open about struggles with depression because you have a chronic, chronic illness. Can you talk a, a minute about that? Yes, um, so it is something I have struggled with for a very long time, um, and it's not something to be taken lightly. Um, my best advice to anyone who's in a similar position, um, especially how I was when I first found out that I was diagnosed, you go through those questions of why, um, why me, uh, things like that. The best thing you can possibly do is reach out. Um, I know on this panel, you have a lot of friends. There are medical professionals that are available to help you if you have a serious enough issue but genuinely just um, remember to take care of yourself at all times. Don't neglect you in this fight. And um, remember that there are people out there who are willing to listen when you need to talk. Yes, so thank you again so much for, for all of that. So absolutely important. Um, I just wanted to make a quick announcement too. Um, you know, you guys just work so, so hard and we have certificates and awards for you and we've got to do that next week. I keep, every week it's like, we've got to do this. So we need to shout you out um, for the amazing, amazing environmental champions that you are. So thank you again so much. And next week we'll also be joined by Dr. Sarah Jean Royer from Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Um, and she'll be talking about the link between plastics and methane and some important things that we can do. So this is um, Sarah Jean, you can see on the, on the screen here. So we've got our guest panelists and she's also a consultant with us. And so I'd like to take the time to uh, make sure that we remember to thank our fabulous uh, consultants. We have Dr. Emily Catalan that helps us with water and also climate action and all the things we do. Uh, we have Julie Morriso that is helping us. She's an architect. So she helps us identify ways that our buildings can be less toxic. So there's something called the San Diego Green Building Council, and I'm happy to announce that they are no longer supporting synthetic turf. Why, why they did in the first place? Or had a question about that? I have no idea, but that's, so that's all fixed now. You just have to make a phone call like, wait. Uh, anyway, but um, Julie does important work um, thinking about how we can eliminate these toxics and um, also works with Surfrider along with Neem, who's not on our panel right now, but shout out to Neem woo -woo, for all your organization and um, thank you for your help with Zero Waste. So Julie will be giving you some tips and I'm really excited for that panel discussion to talk about how we can um, ditch the plastic and make sure, you know, when we can, if we can, um, you know, reuse what we have. Um, and avoid the plastics in our clothes, et cetera. And so we've got um, Sarah Jean next week. We're really uh, so excited to have her on here. So absolutely. So um, Chelsea, I would like to ask you now, if you could tell us a little bit about your hands project. Um, before you had talked about um, John Lewis 
And um, thank you so much for all the important work that you're doing with social justice, uh, racial justice, climate justice, and all of and environmental justice. And I love the contest. We have so many. We have a poetry contest that we didn't talk about tonight, but um, Kevin's a poet and he's we're doing all this great writing for you guys, art contest with Judith, no idling, all that stuff. But anyway, so Chelsea, if you'll take it away and if you'll talk a little bit about um, your hands contest, and then we have cadence. So I know that tonight it is 6.32, so we're a little bit over our time tonight, which I apologize, guys. Thank you for, for being here with us. Um, so cadence is going to share a little bit of info about... Um, Cadence is going to share a little information about, again, how you can take action to help us stop these toxic pesticides here in the county of San Diego. And hopefully this will be a model for other counties uh, across the United States. And with the work of these fabulous panel panelists and our, you know, board, Jay Kloffenstein, um, and our help with from Jim Wong and our wonderful consultants and, you know, all of the great volunteers that we have, thank you so much. Um, we can make great things happen. So Chelsea, I'd love you to talk a little bit about your, um, these are the hands contest. Yes, thank you, Miss Suzanne. <laughs> Here is an activity that you can do to remember people mentioned earlier. It is called These Are the Hands. You can draw or make a model of a hand. Then you can design that hand with its different colors, pictures, or symbols to express the story of people who have worked hard for a better life for others. For more information, please check out our website, cleanearthforkids.org. Thank you, and I can't wait to see all your submissions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks again. Do you want to introduce, do you want to introduce Cadence? Yes. Okay, next up is Cadence, and she has very important information to share with you all. Thank you, Chelsea. I love your These Are the Hands project. It's really creative and such a beautiful way to honor the historical figures who have dedicated their lives to help people. Hi, everyone. My name is Cadence, and I'm a volunteer with Team 5. I'm currently working with a team from Clean Earth for Kids on a project to get pesticides banned on San Diego County land, including lease land. At the high school Chelsea and I attend, there's a tomato company which operates on leased land that's using harmful pesticides such as diazinon and cyfluthrin, along with many other pesticides that have been banned in so many countries around the world. These tomato fields are on county land and one strip is on Oceanside land. This Wednesday, August 5th, the Board of Supervisors will be having a vote and the County of San Diego Department of Agriculture Weights and Measures will give the board four options. We're urging them to vote for option A, which will prohibit the use of glyphosate products and prioritize the use of organic alternatives on all county owned, maintained, and leased properties. Even though glyphosate is just one of the many toxic pesticides that needs to be banned, at least option A will be a start to this process. If they vote A, this change will apply to the tomato field near our high school. Please contact San Diego County's Board of Supervisors through phone calls and emails to urge them to vote A this Wednesday. For providing e-comments, I'll put the link in the chat and also I'll also put the emails and the, uh, of the supervisors and staff in the chat as well. It's so important that we work for change now because the progress that we make will benefit not only people here today and people throughout the world, but all of the future generations who will come after us. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you so much for taking this on. And thank you to all of the youth board. And thank you to Darren for all of the hours of research and Jillian and Cadence and Chelsea. And thank you guys, all of you, Leanna, for showing us that we don't need to use toxic pesticides with your tarping activity. And Catherine for maintaining these trails. You go out there and do all of this important work. Judith, all of you, I just you know, Kevin, thank you for writing the poems about it. Um, you, you guys are just absolutely, absolutely amazing. And Janice is not here. She's done amazing work. And there's so many other people I haven't mentioned. But thank you all so much for this. So if we can, if we can each ask 10 people. So please take a screenshot of this. If you're by a phone, um, you know, or whatever screenshot of this important thing so we can get glyphosate banned on lease land, and then ask them, ask them, tell them, demand of them 
that we ban all toxic pesticides and chemicals on all county property, including leased land. So you've seen Chelsea, you've seen Cadence, they're right there. They are right there. The school is right there. The neighborhoods are right there, right next to these very heinous pesticides that have been known to cause all of these other problems that are banned in multiple other countries. So we absolutely need everyone, everyone to help us get out this information. And so, you know, after this is passed, hopefully, hopefully we are going to get A passed on Wednesday, August 5th at 9 a.m. and that's uh, Pacific time. Then our next step are, is going to be that we are going to march forward with a list of toxic pesticides and chemicals that we need banned. We need to protect the people that you've seen tonight and all those that are, are, are not here. I myself had pesticide poisoning and was very sick. I still have a lung condition because of it. So thank you guys so much. Your work is so important. So Darren, I just wanted to say real quick. So of course, thank you for everything for team five. Um, I'd like to just give you a big shout out for all of the important videos and things that you make and um, all the time it takes to do that. I know one of the videos you edited, it took you over six hours to do it. And we would just like to say from all of us, thank you so much. And we're so proud of you. We know that school orientation, you know, uh, just started and you're, you're so excited about all of that kind of stuff. And thank you for, for all of your important work. Now, Darren, you made a video uh, with Sydney Pitcher, uh, starring Sydney Pitcher. Um, and so that was about environmental justice and protecting communities of color. And that is available on our YouTube channel. And so we're so excited to be hearing that. So hopefully we will be playing that next week. But I'd just like to ask you a little bit about um, being a filmmaker, some future aspirations about films that you'd like to make, and anything else you'd like to say about making these films or uh, what it was like to put this together for Sydney. Anyway, what would you like to share? Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Yeah, first of all, just regarding Sydney, that was just like, it was a privilege to edit it. Like she was just really well spoken, and I really appreciated um, all that she had to say. And I just feel honored that I was the one to just you know put a little bit of some finishing touches on it. Um, but in general, yeah, I really like film editing just because of that. Like I just get to see like the content that people have created already and just make it um, better as much as I can. Um, I'm planning on minoring in film in UCLA, so hopefully. I get to um, at least pursue it as a hobby. So yeah, I'm just excited to, you know, keep editing and keep uh, sharing people's stories. Thank you so much. I guess it's so difficult for someone that who has so many talents. Um, you're great at film editing, writing letters. Um, can you tell us about some letters that you might write to the New York Times and others um, about things you want to share? Yeah, so um, I'm going to be writing some letters um, just, you know, in favor of all of the rollbacks, or not the rollbacks, the rollback trackers, and just how big of an impact that's had, and then a bunch of, uh, or a little bit of information just touching on some of the rollbacks and why those are important. Right, and Judith, um, can you tell us about um, writing, to your ideas about writing about mats? Um, mercury and air toxic standards that you shared with us and also about NEPA to the New York Times and others um, in an editorial um, and uh, tell us what um, you hope to accomplish by doing that. Um, so yeah, I am planning to, well I am going to write an editorial to the New York Times editors of Mats and NEPA. Um, so what I hope to accomplish by doing that is, um, is uh, they, uh, they, uh, okay. I don't know. Um, Sorry to put you on the spot. So here we um, go. So here's the thing. No, Judith puts in all of these hours. Everyone has to know behind the scenes, on every time before she speaks, on every drawing that she does. She is one of the most dedicated people I've ever known in my entire life. Um, I call her like, you know, junior because 
she's the one making sure that, uh, you know, all the stuff is in there. If something's missing, um, she lets me know. Um, so right now, um, maybe she wasn't as articulate as she always is because um, she just is exhausted. But yeah, I got you. I, I agree. Catherine just wrote in the chat. Judith, Judith, you're so awesome. We love you. Yes. So um, things that Judith will be accomplishing um, when she writes these editorials is just to show how very important this is and to talk about why we cannot have these environmental cuts. We've got to protect our air and our water and our endangered species. So I'll answer the question for you, even though you've done all the work. So is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, no, I'm good. <laughs> She's like, you know what? I worked all day yesterday. I worked all day today. I'm good. It's after 6.30. We've gone over. Anyway, so I'd like to thank you guys um, all so much. Um, we're working on some really exciting and fun stories for our curriculum that Leanna mentioned. So um, we, we just have a blast um, on Fridays, uh, Mondays, many days. Uh, there's, you know, Kevin and, and Judith and so many others. And we're real... Uh, it's just a blast to, to work with these students. We have students from NAACP. We have um, Alicia and Elijah and others creating these fun stories that will be in our climate curriculum. So we're so excited about that and our guests. So thank you so much again. And we look forward to seeing you next week. And so I'm going to say um, bye. But before I do, I'll let each of our panelists uh, say something that they would like to share and then sign off. I'll start with Kevin. So Kevin, uh, what would you like to say? Uh, thanks for coming. I, I hope you learned a lot today. I, I certainly did. I'm learning a lot every day just, just by working with Clean Earth for Kids. It's pretty fun. Yeah, we're having so much fun. I can't wait for you guys to see our fun curriculum lessons creative stories that uh, these people come up with. I'm like, wow, it's so fun. Anyway, thank you so much. Okay, so um, Jillian, what would you like to say? Uh, I would just like to say thank you to every panelist that's up here. Thank you to you for all the work that you do. And uh, I'm so proud to have this opportunity to share my experience, even if it is halfway across the country. Um, and then I look forward to doing work in the future. Yeah, we're so happy. You're such a perfect fit for us. You're such a perfect fit for the youth and the youth board and all of us. We're just delighted to have you. We are just so delighted to have you and um, just so thank thankful. Absolutely. So uh, Cadence, what would you like to share? Thank you everyone for coming to the panel today. Um, I'm really glad I had the opportunity to be here. Uh, please remember to call in or take an email or write an email to the uh, County Board of Supervisors and it's listed in the chat. So please try to do that before um, August 5th before because that's when the vote happens. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for all your work. It was, was it yesterday we worked together for seven hours on our plan? Was, yeah. it, was it yesterday? Oh my gosh, okay, yes. Seven hours. Okay, that's a lot. These guys really are putting in the time. Thank you so much. You're so amazing. Absolutely. Liana, what would you like to say? Okay, uh, again, I just want to say thank you for all the panelists and all the attendees. And as you know, today's panel discussion was Youth Working for Change. I'm honestly so inspired by my fellow youth and just positive for all the change that we can create. And I hope that we motivate other youth out there to do the same. You know, it is a privilege to be able to do the work that we do to put in the time we do. And we know not everybody is able to do that and because you know a lot of people have to work hard they have to do they provide for their family there's a lot of other components and that's okay but just um taking the time to just educate yourself when you can um is enough and to educate others that's the best that you can do with the time that little time you may have um so just thank you all again and i really hope that you learned something tonight and that uh you feel inspired Absolutely. And thank you for pointing that out. This is such a privilege to be able to take that time because so many students, uh, youth and others are working, working more than one job to put food on the table. We recognize that every minute that we have together, every minute that we are working, that is, that is a privilege. Thank you so much for saying that. Thank you so much for, for bringing that to our attention. Judith, what would you like to share? Uh, thank you. Sorry. Um, thank you for joining this or watching this panel discussion. And yes, I like to thank all our um, panelists and 
Suzanne for helping us and like create planning for preparing for this panel discussion or every panel discussion and and everyone is so hardworking and I appreciate all of you so yes yes oh thank you so much um Darren what else would you like to add um, I just kind of want to reiterate what other people have been saying like this is like the best team I could ever ask for everyone here is so Yay. passionate and so excited about you know working with all of us and so you know I feel very supported here and I hope that you feel supported by me and also thank you for watching if you're um, just watching the panel too you guys are amazing this is the best team in the world. These are the best people in the world. They have my highest recommendations. So just in case, you know, the state or let's say Harvard or anywhere else is listening, all the people that are pictured in front of me today have my highest recommendation. And so you'll know that because I'll write you letters and let you know. So yes, whatever we can do to help these people get scholarships and get into these schools and make their dreams come true, they're working so hard for us. So let's make sure that we work hard for them. And just please know that every person on this panel, they're not doing it to have it on their resume. They're not doing it to say, oh, I did this or that. They're not. They are 100% the real deal right here. So whatever we can do to help them, we have to do it. So it's gonna be awesome for sure. Catherine, what would you like to say? I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. You're, you guys are all so awesome and you're right. We do have the best team ever and everyone is so supportive and we're really gonna accomplish so much. I'm just really looking forward to working more with you guys. For us, right? With us, of course, thank you. Thank you so much. We're so happy to have you. Yeah. And I, love, I love thinking about all of them, you know, you're out there doing the trail maintenance. The trail and the, maintenance. Yeah, all the stuff that you do. And I know that so many people are hands-on, like, um, for example, Alicia, um, NAACP youth. Um, she's ready to get out there and plant these trees and plant these flowers and get out there and protect. We have so many people that want to do that. And, you know, Kevin was talking about these, this game, you know, from the Philippines. You know, we, we love to play. We love to play games. We love to write stories. We love to do all that fun stuff. So you can send people our way and they fit in wherever they fit in, whether they want to do the creative stuff, whether they want to do the panel discussion, or the trail maintenance or learn about trees or help us in whatever way that looks yeah. like. So thank and you also, so much. I just want to add real quick about trail maintenance because I know Leanna just messaged me. So if any of you guys want to join me, um, we usually go on Thursdays. So um, like Thursdays afternoon. So if you guys want to join, I can put my email in the chat so you guys can email me and then we can work it out with a time and date and stuff like that. So we can do that as well. But everyone's invited if you guys want to, if you guys have the time and are willing to do it, we would love to have you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Also just, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You know, I'm just saying to Catherine that I asked because I also uh, did trail maintenance last summer for a yes. few trails as well. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, that's what I was asking. I I'm like gonna, it a lot. Yeah, it's so fun. And it's a great way to connect with other people mm -hmm. and to learn more about like just nature overall and the environment. So yeah, great yeah. opportunity. Uh-huh. So fun, so fun, absolutely. Chelsea, what would you like to say? I'd just like to thank everybody for helping me out. And I'm learning so much through these panels. So I'm hoping all the viewers are learning as much as I am. I really love being in Clean Earth for Kids because I get to learn so much. I didn't know all these like information beforehand. So yes, I'm really grateful. Thank you everyone. And yeah, for sure. And um, thank you guys. You're amazing. And I'm really excited because Chelsea wants to be a teacher. So I'm like, ah, and I know, I, I, yeah, I, your screen isn't showing right now. So people can't see it, your animated face, but they've seen you before. But how fabulous, how fabulous of a teacher will you be? So there you go. There you go. So fabulous, right? So we have our people going into health, we have people going into nursing, we have people going into all kinds of fields. Um, you know, I'm sure that we'll have people going into, you know, environmental law and all kinds of fields. So, um, oh, I, Cadence uh, wants to be a physician's assistant. Uh, I know that she'll be excellent. Even now, she has the maturity to handle that and she's a rising junior in high school. 
I mean, come on. So amazing. Judith may be a nurse. Kevin, as well, a nurse. Leanna will be in public health and probably the senator of California before she's 40. Um, Jillian's going to be a doctor. Um, yeah, so all of us, um, Catherine, for sure, she's going to be out there. She's going to be, um, these trails are going to be beautiful, working for these parks. Hannah, who's not on here now, will also be working in parks. And Janice is going to be working in water and other important things. So you guys, and I'm sure I love people out, and I'm sorry that I did. We have so many wonderful people. Um, with us and, and all of our volunteers. I'm just thinking of you guys right here, right now, but you're all in my heart. So we're so excited because we get to um, uh, we get to end the panel discussion, but we get to say hi quickly to Sydney Pitcher um, for her beautiful video. Well, we're so, so excited to hear next time um, or the week after our, um, actually probably will be in two weeks that we'll be able to hear that, but you guys can go on YouTube now and look at Sydney's uh, video that Darren helped uh, edit. So yes, thank you again so much. So all right, so I'm going to say good night to the youth. Um, you're welcome to stay on um, for a second. I do have to, um, I did have another meeting, I'll just have to be honest. But that doesn't look like I'm gonna make it to that, that's okay. It was, it's actually about the Green New Deal, just to say. Ooh. So I'm really excited, yes, we have um, this opportunities. Yeah, a zillion opportunities. I cannot wait to connect you with everybody. So that is so awesome. So they had their meeting, um, they had their a meeting tonight and they unfortunately scheduled it at the same time, which they did realize. Anyway, okay, so I'm Thank going you, to have Suzanne. other people hop on. Good night. Good night. Good night. And I'm gonna have, Good night. Other people. Bye.